So let, let's talk about what's riding on this, the meeting that the two had earlier this morning and then the press conference that the president is going to be undertaking in about 23 minutes' time. You know, well, obviously, the U.S.-China relationship is the most important uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic relationship in the world uh, today. And um, uh, obviously markets, but also just average global citizens, I want to know that um, uh, there's some boundaries on this relationship that it's not going to deteriorate. Uh, it's going to be hugely important for markets and hugely important just for the stability of the world. Yeah, I would say economically, there's a lot riding on that, but it almost pales in comparison to some of the other talk that's out there at this point, you know, Cold War, even a hot war. Well, you know, um, our relationship with China, Becky, is just so unusual that, um, you know, during World War II with Nazi Germany, Nazi Germany was an uh, economic peer and a military peer. In the Cold War, the Soviet Union was a military peer, but uh, not an economic peer. We, the only thing they sold us and we cared about was uh, caviar and uh, matryoshka dolls and vodka. Um, what is so unusual about the U.S.-China relationship is that it's an economic peer. Um, it's a geopolitical peer, or increasingly so, and we're completely intertwined. So we really never had this kind of relationship with another power uh, in, in the modern era. And so sorting out how you manage those three vectors is, is just really difficult. I, I think it's really interesting, something you wrote in a column earlier this month where you talked about this new mindset that Western multinational companies have at this point. Anybody who's looking to decide where to put a factory has this ABC mentality, you said. It's anywhere but China. What a, what a shift this has, has made, and that's a big deal, not just for these multinationals, but also for China. How, how are they feeling with that strain? Yeah, it was coined by my colleague uh, in, in Beijing, Keith Bradshaw, you know, um, that for every multinational now, many are still obviously doing business in China, some expanding. But in terms of building their next supply chain, um, it really is anywhere but China. And that what column I wrote about Becky was really saying, you know, if China were a democracy today, one of the biggest questions that it would be asking itself is, who lost America? Who lost America? I mean, this country um, had the biggest, freest, most powerful and influential lobby in Washington, D.C. that any country or company could ever imagine. They had the U.S. business community. That, that business community was always the buffer in the relationship um, and always an advocate for stronger, deeper economic ties with, with China and, and, and stable uh, geopolitical ones. And in many ways, China lost that business community. Uh, too many companies felt that uh, they weren't being treated fairly or weren't getting out of the China market what they'd hoped for. And they basically kind of drifted away. And that, to me, is one of the biggest structural changes in the relationship. Does Xi Jinping care? I mean, it, it's not a democracy. It's yeah. a complete totalitarian. Uh, oh, uh, he, has, he has to care. Because um, when the motto is among global multinationals anywhere but China, um, you know, that, that plays out in the long term. Fewer companies investing in China, fewer companies uh, transferring technology to China. Uh, that, that's a huge challenge for Xi Jinping. So lay out how much dicier this gets if we were already in a situation where we know it's a symbiotic re relationship, we rely on each other in a lot of ways. If that fractures and kind of falls apart because it didn't look like it was working, then what? Well, that would be a terrible thing. You know, I really believe, Beck, if you look back um, in the last, you know, 40, 50 years, the, the period 1979 to 2019 was an epoch in, in U.S.-China relations. I call it the epoch of unconscious integration, where if you were an American company, you wanted to have a supply chain in China, a factory in China. You wanted your kid to study at Beijing University. Um, you just did it. And if you were a Chinese, you wanted to buy a factory in Ohio. You wanted to send your kid to uh, Ohio State. You wanted to be listed on the NASDAQ. You just did it. And over those 40 years, we really became one country, two systems. We were the real one country, two systems, not Hong Kong and China. Um, and, and two things flowed from, from that level of integration. One, uh, some 800 million people came out of abject poverty around the world. It was really the driver of globalization. And secondly, there was no great power conflict. Yes, we had wars, but there was no great power conflict like we're seeing today. And um, unfortunately, that, that period is over. And now we're in the transition to see what comes next. Can we, these two peer rivals, foster a relationship that, that at least preserves the, a lot of the benefits of that last 40 years, but deals with the fact that we are peer rivals, we are going to compete, and we don't share values? You know, during those 40 years, what happened really, Becky, the biggest structural changes, for 30 of those 40 years, China sold us what I call shallow goods, goods we wore on our shoulders, 
tennis shoes we wore on our feet, solar panels we put on our roof. They were shallow, basically. We sold China deep goods, software and hardware. And then one day, about 10 years ago, China, and by the way, when we bought their shallow stuff and they bought our deep stuff, our attitude to China was, you know, we really don't care whether you're authoritarian, libertarian, or vegetarian, because we're just buying your shallow stuff. But when they could suddenly sell us deep stuff like Huawei 5G, then the difference in values between us really, really started to stress the relationship.